The Bible reflects to us that while he was at the throne, by people as their king. But God had ended his throne. In chapter 15, you learn that while even when Saul was still sitting at the throne, because he disobeyed God, while people saw him and acknowledged him as their king, God had already dethroned him. God rejected him as king. It makes me think that at times we can sometimes we can we can be something else in people's eyes while we are something else in God's eyes. Because Saul, he thought in people's eyes he was a king, but in God's eyes he was rejected as the king of the Israelites. On this study, though. I want us to reflect for a moment in the life of David, the son of Jesse. He was the 12th son of the, and the youngest in his family. God, in reclaiming to shape his people, he sent some the prophets to his home. He is given a specific order to anoint a king, but no name was given to him as to who to anoint amongst the sons of Jesse. This is done to illustrate how human thinking differs from God's view and observation of character and of individuals. In verse 6 and verse 7, reflects how people pick based on the looks and the past, the outside appearance. It gives us what it, when they came, even Samuel the prophet, because of how they look from the outside, because of their resemblance, because of their stature, he thought they were the ones to be anointed as king. And yet God rejected them. And in verse 8 and verse 10 to verse 10, you read that picking from the pecking order, opting for age and tenure over ability, where status counts, people defined by what they have instead of who they are. Some scholars argue that the sons of Jesse were so handsome and good looking and were brought up from a good family that had a good structure and good ethics and values. So in a sense, they knew how to preach. They knew how to pray. They dressed so well. And when you heard them pray, you would think, wow, these people were closer to God. When you would hear them and see them doing the things for God, you would think, wow, these people are so closer to God. But when they are brought into the presence of God, the Bible says God rejected them. For God saw the inside, not the outside appearance. I want to say most of the time we can sound good. We can look good. We can be articulate in the way we do church, in the way we do things, and yet in the eyes of God, we are not and void. So, but the selection of David illustrates on how God often disregard, disregard the human customs and tradition to accomplish his purposes. By human standards, David, as the youngest son of Jesse, he appears less likely to be considered for leadership position. But God saw the heart of leadership in him. A young man with a good heart. And God saw this 
one would be good to leading my people. Let me just speak of four visible signs, four visible characters that shaped David's life to build the inner person within him. Four visible characters. The first one is that the thing that was unique about David, he was not only a church goer, he was not only grown and brought up in a Christian manner, but David revered God. He feared God. He felt a deep respect and adoration for the things of God. He had a godly spirit within him that made him bold to stand on what he believed in. Because God uses those whose faith makes them bold. God uses those whose faith makes them bold. Because David, because David revered God when visiting his brothers in chapter 17 on the battlefield, seeing a giant, a fearful man, Goliath, challenging the entire army to face him. I believe the thing that moved David to confront the Philistine it is when he heard him insulting his God, the God of Israelites. When he heard the Philistine insulting his God, he, had, he applied what many scholars ascribe to as the seven laws of victory. The seven laws of victory. When you want a progressive life, these are what scholars ascribe to as the seven laws of victory. The first one, his perspective differed from others. Amen. He didn't see what others saw. An invisible giant, he saw an opportunity. Instead of being threatened by this giant man, he changed his mind and he did not see what others saw. Because in verse 47 you read, then all, then all the assembly shall know that there is a God in Israel who does not save with sword or spear. For the battle is the Lord's. When people fear, he saw that the battle is the Lord. The second thing that he saw, the second, his, the second thing, his method differed from others. He decided to use the proven weapons that he knew would mark, not the conventional way, that he knew, that he knew would work, not the conventional ones. For in verse 45, you read, you came, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of High. He did not, he used a different method than others. Thirdly, his conviction differed from others. He recognized Goliath had no covenant with God while he felt passionately committed to God's covenant, so he never gave up. Number four, his motives differed from others. His motives differed from others. He had Goliath's threat against the God of Israelites and trusted God to defeat him. My question is that when you make your own decisions, what drives you? What influences you? What propels your motives? Number five, his vision differed from others. He wanted to make Yahweh known to the world as the most powerful God. 
Rick Warren in his book, The Purpose Driven Life, in his first chapter of his first book, he writes the words that it is not about you. The reason you live, the reason you were created, the reason you exist today, it is not really about you. It is about the glory of God. Number six, he experienced, his experience differed from others. He brought to him to the battlefield the first, the first victories over the lions and the bear, not the image of himself and the size of his weapon. Hear a testimony of the power of God in his life. The reason we behave the way we behave, the reason we do things the way we do them, the reason we dress the way we do, it is because of the testimony we care of the power of God in our lives. If you have no testimony to carry, that is the reason you are a jack of all trades. That is the reason that you are a chameleon, you live a chameleon lifestyle. When you fit to certain people, when they drink, you drink. When they dance, you dance. When they curse, you curse. When they pray, you pray. It is because you have no testimony of the power of God in your life. You have no Damascus, ah. no godly experience of where you met with your Savior and how that has influenced your life to change, to become a better person. The last thing is that his attitude differed from others. He saw Goliath not as a threat too big to hit, but as a target too big to miss. I want to say in life, it is your attitude that determines your altitude. When you think of yourself as a failure, you become a failure. When you think low of yourself, you live with self-low morals and characters. But when you think higher and better of yourself, you become as a result of your own thoughts. Because your attitude determines your altitude. The second thing that marked the life of David is that he had a remarkable character. Your character counts. David had a remarkable character. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but Lord, the God looks at the heart. The voice of the youth has to be heard. Dr. R.C. Sprouts, teaching about the life of David, he says, David was a man after God's heart. So David is a picture of a spiritual life of a believer who walks by faith in the Lord. But when you read about David, I want you to note, David was not a perfect man. He was not perfect. He had actually committed many sins. Even some of the sins that he committed, some could not even mention. He committed many sins and some are too scary to mention. But he knew how to confess how to repent, how to plead for God's mercy. He learned from his mistakes. He lived with the consequences of his actions. Because you know, you must know in life that whatever decision you make and whatever thing that you do in your life, there are consequences for your action. So David, David, he lived with the consequences of his actions. The third thing that I like about David, I'll come back to these things, is that he expected challenges as the package of his vocation. Cornet, allow me to suggest that you cannot know how much faith you have until you are put to a 
test. David was 17 years when anointed by King Saul, by Samuel, the prophet, as king. When his life was blessed, after his anointing, when you read the Bible, it tells you that his life changed because blessings were upon him. Doors of opportunities opened towards him, to his life. His talent as a musician, it led him to the palace. He went to stay in the palace. His courage in facing Goliath made him a celebrity. Even people sang about him. They said Saul had killed thousands, but David had killed 10,000, which made the heart of Saul to turn against him. We need to know that to whom more is given, more is expected. The more blessed blessings you acquire in your life, the more challenges will come your way. For life automatically balances itself. Not everyone will love you for your blessings. Some sought to kill him. It was in that liminal space, liminal space. I want you to note that changes and shaping of young persons today in changing the inner being, it happens in a liminal space. For that we understand that in your life you will enter a stage that is called a liminal space. It was at that liminal space. It's a time between what was and the next. It was a time between what was and the next. A place of transition. A season of waiting and not knowing. Liminal space is where transformation takes place. We wait, we learn to wait and let it and, and, and let it form us. You must understand that even for someone, Joseph entered a liminal space in his life. You must understand when 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 David when David is taken into the palace, he was already anointed as king. He knew that Samuel Saul, as he sits there, is the king that is rejected by God. But he went to the liminal space of waiting from what was and what was to become. He never rushed into it. He waited for God's opportunity, for God's kairos, for God's opportune time. Even when you read in the life of Joseph the dreamer, he was 17 when he dreamt of his brothers bowing before him, when the moons and the stars were bowing before him. But for 13 years, he went into a liminal space. Where he went into there, he was sold and he went into prison. 13 years later, did he experience the reward of what God has promised him. Even for David, he went into a liminal space for 13 years. Liminal space is a space that shapes us for what we are to become. He knew that he was a God, God chosen king. He lived as a musician in the palace. God positioned him there to observe the rituals of the palace and discern how to lead his people. For nothing in your life happens by mistake. But in that liminal space, he had to take, he had to duck the sword of Paul. Most Bible exhorters argue that the liminal space are meant to
to be lived in for a certain amount of time as you transition to the next stage of your life. It is the liminal space where God raises a Jonathan in your life to manifest the power of God. Actually, for many people, when you live the life, the life of Abraham, he went into a liminal, liminal space for more than 30 years because he was at the age of 75 when God promised him to make him the father of nation, to give him the generation and blessings of sons that were more than the sands of the sea. At the age of 85, after 10 years of waiting for God's blessings to manifest in his life, him and Sarai began to give up and wanted a shortcut where they engaged with Hagar to give Abraham a son. And even when they did, God said, this is not the one that comes from me. It was only at the age of 99 from the promise that was given to him while she was 75. When God came and blessed Hagar with a son. Because what is impossible with men is possible with God. I want to say in your life what you are destined to be. It does not matter how long it takes. You must know that it will come your way. But for God to shape you and mold you, he takes you into a liminal space where you wait for God's opportune time, for God's kairos, for things to manifest in your life. You don't have to hurry. You don't have to twala or tagata. You don't have to visit his angle so that you rush your blessings in your life. If you are meant to be a millionaire, you will become one. If you are meant to be rich, you will become rich. Continue doing what is right and wait for God's opportune time to come your way. But the second person that I want to speak about, that in the liminal space of waiting, God sends a Jonathan to manifest his power. Jonathan was Saul's son, a person whom David could least expect help from. But God made him the best friend so that he can save his life. Sometimes your help in life will come where you least expect. You must understand, I pray in my life for the spirit of Jonathan that is able to discern when God has moved from a person and choose to be with those to whom God dwells. The power of Jonathan is that when he noticed that the spirit of God had moved from his father, he chose to move away from his father and chose to be with David. We are here today in ministry. We are what we are today because of some Jonathans who came our way. The mothers we never knew who prayed for us. Those who adopted us when some churches rejected us. If you know it, Jonathan prays for you. Jonathan is a person who prays for you. A Jonathan is a person who believes in your dream. A Jonathan is a person who loves you unconditionally. In your life and vocation, to shape a young person, to change an inner being, you must pray for a Jonathan in your life or that you become someone's Jonathan in your life. He chose his friend over his father because God lived in his friends. It took him 30 years, 13 years to become a king. I wonder what influences 
your decisions in life. For in a liminal space, you must never lose who you are, your character, and your faith. The last thing that I want you to learn, the fourth thing I want you to learn about the life of David, is that he cared for others. The reason he was chosen by God is that he would sacrifice his life for the sake of others. He never lived a selfish life. He knew how to wait for the right time, for God's kairos, the opportune time, God's timing. When he was king, years later, 13 years later, he remembered Jonathan and what Jonathan had done on his life. If I were to preach on Sunday, coordinator, this was going to be the text that I was going to use. The people who help you in life, the people who've prayed for you to get to get to where you are, make sure in your life you never forget those people. The people who nurtured your life and secured you, even if they become nothing, even when they are not there. Because the Bible says when David became king, Jonathan was no longer alive. But the answer came when he asked. And Jonathan. The answer came. Kuta is an unimportant man. A squad. A cripple. Who may be